It calls, uh, you be scared. Oh, Jonathan, it's okay. All right. When, when, when we begin to receive the impossible that God does on our behalf, what happens is we get used to it. And we get what one person says, ruined for the ordinary. We don't want to deal in the ordinary anymore because we've grabbed a hold of the impossible. And, and that's why the scripture said that it's, it's impossible for someone who has tasted of the heavenly gift if they turn away to renew them again. That's why we have to renew ourselves. We have to recover ourselves if we turn away and start operating in the ordinary again when we have broken into the impossibility of God. And see, because the impossible becomes addictive, Satan doesn't want us in. He doesn't want us to break in. Let me, let me give you a little foundational lesson real quick. Um, we, we've often... Uh, even when we're talking about uh, spiritual warfare, talk, talk about uh, sending stuff back to the pit of hell. Let me tell you something. The kingdom of darkness don't operate in hell. That's where they're destined. But they don't operate from hell. Their headquarters is in the heavenlies. That's why the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Their, their headquarters is in the heavens. They meet and congregate in heavenly places over our head in the atmosphere and they are trying to keep us from getting a hold of what God wants us to have. They are there because they know that if we can connect earth with heaven, it creates an open door and a portal to where blessings and power will be moved uninterrupted. Yes, Lord. That's why when Jesus was on earth, he said that, that I saw angels ascending and descending. They're ascending and descending. Ascend. That's when Jacob, Jacob saw an open heaven. He said he saw the ladder and there were angels ascending and descending. Why? Because he was in a place where heaven and earth met. That's why he named the place Bethel, the house of the Lord. Just give us a foundation right now. And see, what happens is, is that Satan and all of the kingdom of darkness, they fight to keep heaven and earth from meeting. That's why in the end, when Jesus comes back, he comes back to do warfare. Why? Because he's taken, already raptured and taken the church and the Holy Ghost out of the earth. And now, all of the kingdom of darkness, they come down the earth they say, oh, he's gone now. Now we can do what we want to. And that's why you have the Antichrist and the man of sin who are now ruling the earth after the church has been raptured. Just foundational stuff, right? And so, and so when Jesus comes back, that's why he, the church doesn't go to heaven when they are raptured. They meet him in the middle of the air. <laughs> And they are there and they are receiving rewards and judgment and having the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then when they come back and it said when he comes back, the people that are with him are called faithful. And they are adorned in white. It's the church coming back with him and they come down and they begin to do warfare on the earth. Why? Because everything, Jesus has come back and he's took it The church and heaven is being together. And now the church and heaven is going down to the earth and now getting ready to cleanse the earth so that heaven and earth can come together and God can have one kingdom and one dominion. You get that? I don't know why I'm laying all that foundation, but, but it's good to me right now. Heaven and earth becomes one. And so what, what is happening is now Satan and his kingdom, they are there in heavenly places trying to keep heaven and earth from me. Let me take you somewhere. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10. <laughs> Daniel chapter 10. I need to go to 
go here. I just feel God lead me here. Thank you.
or spiritual dark princes. That's what he's doing. And so when he's talking about the kings of Persia, it is talking about dark, demonic princes who stopped him from getting there. Why? Because they're seated in the middle of the air. They stopped him from getting there, but when he kept praying, when he did what? Yeah. When he kept praying, God said, okay, he's serious about this. So God now sends Michael, the archangel. Now, he didn't send no Rudy Poon angel. He sent the most powerful angel in heaven to come down and meet Gabriel and escort him down. Why? Because Daniel chose to invade the impossible and did not let up until he got what he was expecting. Yes. He didn't let up until what? He got what he until he got what he was expecting. And that's what I came to talk to you about today. I came to talk to you about not letting up until you get what you expect. You have to invade the impossible because there is a kingdom that does not want you to receive what you are expecting from God based upon what God said. And all too often what we do is once we receive the word, we start breaking in and receiving just a little trickle of what God said and then we back up. back up. But if we're going to invade the impossible, we have to have violent faith. <laughs> we have to have what? Violent, violent faith. faith. Violent faith. Let's talk about faith and find out what it is. We have to have violent faith. Let's go to Luke chapter 17. So Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16, there's so much going on in this particular passage that you can pull so much out of it, but I just want to pull just a little bit of something from it. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus, he starts out and he's talking about greed and talking about money. And uh, he, he begins to state the fact that no man can turn, serve two masters, either you'll love one or hate the other. He said, you can't worship God and money. And, and, and while he was talking, you had some people who were standing around who felt that their, uh, their significance came from what they had. They felt that their significance came from the amount of money they had, the prestige that they had, and they, they began to speak out against Jesus. Now watch this. Verse 15, after they began to speak out against Jesus, it says, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. What he's saying, he, he's really letting them know that God is not impressed with how much money you have. He's not impressed with how, how, how flashy your clothing is. He's not even impressed with your status. He's not impressed with how many Facebook friends you have, how many Twitter followers you have, how many Instagram followers you have. He's not impressed with your position in your job. He's not impressed with any of that, but he is impressed with only one thing. Watch this. He's impressed with the kingdom. And the kingdom was very little known at that time. Watch, watch what he says in verse 16. He said, the law and the prophets were until John. This is John the Baptist. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. And every man does what? They what? Every man pressed into it. They pressed into it. That word press, it comes from the Greek word biazo. B-I-A-Z-O. 
Biazo. The word biazo means to use force, to apply force, to force, to inflict violence on. So in other words, if we're going to enter into the power of the kingdom, we have to be violent. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew chapter 11 verse 12. He said the kingdom of God permits violence and the violent take it by force. If we're going to get into the impossible, we have to invade. We have to invade it with force, with a violent force. And, and the force that we invade it with is faith. See, what we must understand is that faith is not some strategy. It is not a religious principle. Faith is a violent, unstoppable, unmovable force. What did I say faith was? Violent, unstoppable, Faith is a violent, unstoppable, unmovable force. All right? So, so, so uh, it is an unstoppable, unmovable force. He says in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20 B. Don't turn there. You can turn there if you want to, or you can write it down. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20 B. He says, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible for you. That's in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20 B. He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, he didn't say, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. We misinterpreted that. He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed. See, a mustard seed, though it is small, it has so much hidden potential on the inside of it. Now, he's not talking about a mustard seed that you use to plant mustard greens. No, he's talking about a seed that is used to plant a mustard tree. It is a small seed, but they use it to plant mustard trees. And Jesus said in one text that when you plant a mustard seed in the ground, when it springs up, its leaves are so abundant that all of the flocks of the, of, of the air can come and rest in it. From that one little seed. That one little seed has so much potential that it can, number one, break open the dirt. And then when it breaks open the dirt, it provides, watch this, oxygen. Because its green leaves provide oxygen. It brings life into the earth. Watch this. And then not only does it break open the dirt and the deadness and bring life to deadness, but then it begins to produce fruit. Watch this. And the fruit, you can eat from But not only can you eat from it, you can take that same fruit to the market, sell it, and make income. Watch this. It, it, it breaks open dead, produces life, produces fruit that can provide food and provide even income, and all of that came from one seed. So when Jesus started talking about having faith as a mustard seed, he said, if you understood what you really had. Now he's talking to his disciples. I'm going to show you how he says it again a little bit later. He's talking to his disciples and he said, he said, he said, if you have faith as a mustard seed. He's talking to them because they said, Lord, increase our faith. Let's, let's go to Luke chapter 17. This is the same conversation that he's having with them. Luke chapter 17. It's a continuation of the conversation in Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus begins to talk to them. Verse 1. Y'all still with me? Y'all yeah. understand this? Yeah. Okay, is it making sense to you? Yeah. All right. He, he, watch this. He, he tells them in Luke 17, watch this. He tells them, he says, Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It is better for him to have a millstone were hanged 
about uh, his neck and he cast into the sea that, that he should offend one of these little ones. But then he said, he said, that's what's going to happen to the person who brings the offense. But then he says in verse 3, he said, but take heed to yourselves. In other words, don't worry about who bringing the offense. He said, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against you, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So Jesus is saying, okay, it's time to grow up. He said, it's time to forgive. He said, because you must understand that you are going to be offended in this life. You're going to be offended in this life. He said, so, so get used to it. Take heed to yourself. Don't worry about who bringing the offense. Then the only thing you need to do is tell them what they did wrong. When they say they're sorry, you should forgive them. That'll be the end of the discussion. It's over with at that point. Just forgive them. Doesn't mean you don't need healing, but you should forgive him. All right? So, so that's the end of the discussion. Watch this, watch this. And then the apostles came to him in verse 5 and said unto him, Lord, increase our faith. Then Jesus says the same thing. He said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamore tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Now he said, he said, he said, you, you asking me to increase your faith, but I want to let you know you really don't have faith at all anyway. Because, right, it, he goes on to talk about the forgiveness thing, and he gives another parable. He says, if you had a servant, a person who was working for you, and they go out to the field, and they, 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 they're responsible for going out to the field and cleaning up, and, and, and plowing the field, he said, and then you come, they come in, and you sit down, and you wait on your meal, and they're responsible for also bringing you your meal. When they come to you and bring, them, bring you your meal, are you going to stand up and say, Woo! You did such a great job. He said, no, because that's what they were responsible for in the first place. That's what you paid them for. He said, so, so, so don't think that you're going to be applauded and somebody will give you a cookie because you forget. <laughs> he said, you don't need faith to do that. That's just your duty to do that. Yes. That's your duty. And so he's talking to them about faith. He said, you must understand, if you had faith, forgiveness would not be an issue for you. If, if you, don't get mad at me, y'all. I'm telling you, if, if you, if you had faith, you wouldn't be tripping about forgiveness. That would just be a natural order of things. <laughs> all right, all right. So, so I'm still talking about violent faith. I'm still talking about invading the impossible. Still talking about that. Right? So, so God wants us to have what? Violent faith. What did I say faith was? It's a violent, unstoppable, movable force. Jesus said that if you had faith, you could literally say to a mountain, move, and it'll move. At your command. He wasn't talking about a metaphor or an allegory. He was saying that faith is so powerful that it can move stuff. Yes. It can move whatever is in your way. You know how you see a locomotive or a train that is on a track. Once it gets its momentum up, when anything tries to get in its way, it will run it over. Or it needs to move out the way. See, that's how faith is. When you begin to operate in faith and begin to break forth into the impossible, anything that is in your way is either going to jump out the way or going to get run over. Yes, and the church say, all right. All right, all right. So, 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 so how, how do we, we operate in this unstoppable move? A movable force. How how do we get it to flow out of it? Because the Bible says that God has given unto every man what? The measure of faith. Every last one of us who are born again, we have faith. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have faith. It is already in you. It's what? Already in us. It's 
already in you. So how, how do, do I, I operate in this faith? First thing we must understand is that number one, the Bible says in Galatians that if we be Abraham's seed, uh, then we are the children of faith. Okay, so, 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 uh, and, and the Bible also says in Galatians 3 and 29, if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed according to the promise. Watch this. See, we are, we are part of Christ. We're born again because we believe in Jesus Christ. That makes us Abraham's seed. Abraham was the father of what? He was the father of what? Faith. He was the father of faith because Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Abraham was the father of faith. So if we are Christ, then we're Abraham's seed. Now, Abraham believed God and he got exactly what he was expecting, right? The Bible says Abraham staggered not at the promises of God. That means when God made him a promise, he didn't turn away from it. He kept expecting it. Why? Because faith is a violent, moving, unstoppable force. Okay? All right. So, so, so then we must also understand that, that we are uh, brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has made us his brother. The Bible says that we're joint heirs with Christ. Okay? We're brothers of Jesus Christ. Now, if we're brothers with Jesus Christ, the Bible says that Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. Right? Judah was one of the, the sons of, of Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons who made up 12 tribes. Right? He was one of the 12 sons that made up 12 tribes. And, and so Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. Okay? But not only was Jesus from the tribe of Judah, prophetically speaking, Jesus is a lion from the tribe of Judah. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. <laughs> Revelation chapter 5. Verse number 5. I want you to see it. It's going to all make sense just a little bit. Look at somebody say, hang with the preacher. Hang with the preacher. Hang with the preacher. Now, 15 more minutes in my head. All right. It says, and one of the elders said unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to loosen the seven seals thereof. So it is talking about Jesus Christ. He is the lion from the tribe of Judah. He's the what? Lion. From where? Tribe of Judah. Okay. If he's the lion from the tribe of Judah and we are his brothers, that means we're from Judah too. The Bible says it also uh, in, uh, let me get back to my scripture. Amen. The Bible says also in uh, uh, Galatians chapter 4 verse 26 that the Jerusalem from above is our mother. That means the place where, where Jerusalem was is where Judah abides. Judah, that tribe, lives in Jerusalem. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm laying a foundation. Judah lives in Jerusalem. So, so, so we are a part of that same tribe. Right? We're part of that same tribe. Now, now if Jesus functioned like a lion from Judah, and we are Christians, Christian means what? Christ-like. Christ-like. If we are Christians, and we are to be Christ-like, if Jesus functioned like a lion, we ought to function like a lion. Yes, Lord. See, in salvation, we function like lambs. A lamb say, Matt, I need you. Help me. But if we're going to rule, we have to function like a lion. Because a lamb can't rule. A lamb is the weakest, dumbest animal that lives. But a lion is the strongest, most fierce animal that exists. If we're going to rule and invade the impossible, we have to function like what? Lion. Somebody say, oh. Lion. Yeah, there you go, there you go. We have to function like lions. See, see, watch this. See, there, there, there's a dog, a shit, uh, not, not a shit zoo, but, but a, 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 what do you call it? A chow chow. A chow chow looked like a lion, but when a chow chow opened his mouth, the only thing he said, Ain't nobody running from 
on that? <laughs> Not nothing big going on from it. <laughs> but when a lion opens his mouth and roar, everything in his atmosphere has to back up. That's how our faith has to be. Our faith cannot be no roof. Our faith has to be a roar. Somebody say it again. Say ah. <laughs> I felt that. Mm -hmm. See, see, watch this. If we are Christians, we have to be like who we're modeling after. And Christ, he died as a lamb, but when he rose up to rule, he rose up like a lion. Yes, sir. Ah. Yes, sir. Watch this. Uh, let's, let's go back and look at the prophecy about Christ. When he was spoken of, it, we, we, we're from what tribe? Judah. We're from Judah. Judah. All right. In Genesis 49. Let's go to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. Lord, help me get this. Genesis chapter 49. This is. Uh, Jacob, who is now Israel, God changed his name from Jacob to Israel because he wrestled with God and didn't stop wrestling until he got what he was expecting. And, and it said that Jacob was getting ready to die. He, he was an old man now. He, he was over 100 years old. Old man, getting ready to die. But it said that before he died, he called his sons around his bed so that he could speak over them and bless them. And it said that Israel strengthened himself and set up. Old man, frail, but he cheated death because death was getting ready to take him out and he strengthened himself and set up and began to speak over his sons. Now watch what he begins to speak when he begins to speak over Judah in verse number eight. He says, Judah, Art thou he whom thy brethren shall praise? Thy hand shall be in the what? In the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. In other words, he said, Judah, you, when you begin to operate, you are not going to operate like no little a lamb. Amen. He said, you are going to operate like a fierce, forceful creature, and your hand is going to be in the neck of your enemies. He said, you're not going to run from your enemy. You're not going to hide from them. You're going to chase them down and hit them in the throat. <laughs> Pull it up. <laughs> he said, your hand shall be in the neck of your enemies. Look at verse 9. He said, Judah is a lion's will, or a baby lion. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him up? He said, in other words, he's going to start out like a little baby lion, but when he grow up, he's going to be a big lion. Come on, say it again. Say rawr. He said, verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. We used to call it Shiloh, but it's Shiloh, and unto him the gathering of the people shall be. He said, he said that when he begins to rule, he's not going to stop ruling until Shiloh come. In other words, until Jesus shows up. That Shiloh is a prophetic name for Jesus. He said he's not going to ever stop ruling until Shiloh come. So that means that if we are Christ-like Christians, we're from the tribe of Judah, we function like lions, that means we don't stop having dominion until Jesus comes back. Mercy. We are never to be beneath our enemies. We are to always be above only and not beneath. Yes, sir. Say it again, sir. Ah. Ah. He said, he said, binding his foe to the vine, verse 11, and his ashes go unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grace. In other words, when he began to fight, he fought so fiercely, he went through his enemies so fiercely that everything that he had on was drenched in blood. He said, he didn't take no prisoners. All right. He was kicking behind and taking down. Yes. <laughs> Wasn't nothing stopping him. Right. Watch this, watch this. It says in verse 12, 
It says, his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. His eyes shall be red with what? Wine. And his teeth white with milk. Watch this. A little lion, watch this, he, was a, he, he started out a little lion. A little lion eats milk from the mother's breast. See, when we start off as Christians, we start off with milk. When we, I said, when we, when we what? Start out. When we what? Start out. When we start out as Christians, we start off with milk. Watch this. Let's go to First Peter chapter two, <coughs> verse one through two. First Peter chapter two, verse one through two. He begins to talk to uh, uh, the, the, the the children and talk to the Christians and the believers during this time. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, he says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the still milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. In other words, you not grown yet because you still upset about how somebody lied on you, talked about you, looked at your baby wrong, looked at you wrong, stepped on your foot and you're not grown yet, so you still need the sincere milk of the word so you can grow up. Yes, See, if mean, you're still bothered by how people respond to you, you're not grown yet. You still need to be on milk. Right. Still got some of behind your ears in the spirit. <laughs> you can't use your eyes. Watch this. Even though we start out with milk, we ought to be progressing up to me. Yes. Watch this. At some point, we ought to progress up to me. Go to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the Jews who are scattered abroad throughout the whole world at the time. And so he begins to talk to them and he tells them, he, he rebukes them. He says in verse 12, he said, For when for the time? Ye ought to be teachers. See, you've been in church long enough to where you ought to be teaching other folk. Say, when for a time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You got to go back to the mill. He said, and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Because you still worry about how folk treat you. Still worry about how people act like hypocrites. Don't even worry about them. He said, take heed to yourself, right? Okay. He said, you, you have become one to, as such as have need of milk and not strong meat. Verse number uh, 13. And hey, you go ahead and turn it out. I think the battery went down. Amen. Stop to tell you get the play again. But we don't need that on the screen no way. Okay. We move all over here then. All right. All right. He said, verse number 13, watch what he said. He says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. If you still need milk to go back and deal with how people offended you, if you still need milk to worry about folk who act like hypocrites, if you still need milk to learn how to get over your bitterness, then you are unskillful in the word of righteousness. Watch this. He said, but strong meat belonging to them that are of what? Full age. Full age, even though who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, when you get on meat, you can discern that the person is not your enemy. It's the enemy behind your enemy that you're dealing with. You're dealing with spiritual wickedness in high Watch this. When we get to meat, 
we're able to discern what's going on. But when we get to why, we're able to deal with what's going on. <laughs> uh, see, when we get to me, we can discern what's going on. But when we get to why, we can deal with what's going on. It said that the lion, it says his eyes shall be red with wine. <laughs> uh, you know what happens when you get that stuff in your system? Yeah. <laughs> you begin to operate in a certain way. It's <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna talk about it here in just a minute. Don't act like you don't know. Come on. We in a new perspective. You know how we do things. When you get that stuff in your system, you're not acting like yourself anymore. You acting like somebody told you different. God, I got five minutes help me get through this. He says his eyes shall be red with wine. See when 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 when, when there are two brands of wine that the believer ought to be drinking. I'm not talking about wild Irish rose, I'm talking about Manischewitz, not talking about Chirac, not talking about Hey Henderson, not talking about uh, 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 the Crown Law. I'm not talking about any of that. But there are two brands of wine that the believer ought to be drinking. Let me tell you what brands of wine that the believer ought to be drinking. Not talking about the Bathroom Moscato, not talking about any of that. Not talking about the, the Della Rosa, I'm not, none of that. Not talking about that. I'm talking about some real wine. Look, look at somebody say, he's talking about the new wine. The first brand of wine is the brand, watch this, the first brand of wine is the brand of the Holy Ghost. The brand of the Holy Ghost. Watch this, when you go over to Acts, chapter 2, verse 13 through 16, it said that, that watch this, the, 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 you go ahead and turn there while I'm talking about this. God, in, 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 in Acts chapter 2, it said that when the believers were all in one place, on one accord, talking about the integrity, right? They were all in one place on one accord. It says, suddenly a sound came from heaven like a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues of fire stood over them and they all began to speak in an unknown language that they never learned before as the Spirit gave them utterance. And it said they began to speak in unknown tongues. See, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it begins to get you drunk with something that begins to take over. Yes, yes sir. Yes. See, we, we, like, watch this. You don't have to be saved. Uh, you don't have to have a baptism of the Holy Spirit to be saved. Yes, sir. You don't even have to have a baptism of the Holy Spirit to have the Holy Spirit living in you. Right. You're born again just by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Uh, yes. And watch this. Don't let nobody tell you that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. And you don't have the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, no man can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. You couldn't even get saved unless the Holy Ghost came in and gave you the power to get saved. Yes, and watch this. You don't have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be saved. But you do have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit to rule like a lie. Yes, to have some power. Because Jesus said, after that the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, you shall receive power and be my witnesses. In other words, you can be like a lion when you get the Holy Ghost drenching you. When you get drunk with the Holy Ghost. And watch this. While they were beginning to speak tongue, speak in these languages that they had never learned, it said that people came from all around. They were all there in Jerusalem, in Judah. <laughs> they were in Jerusalem. Where in where? Judah. Where are we from? Judah. We're from the line. We're from the tribe of Judah. It said they were in Judah. Now when you go to verse number 13, Acts chapter 2. You there? I guess I need to get there, right? Acts chapter 2, verse 13. Acts chapter 2. Verse 13. <laughs> yeah, let me get a little too carried away. I we'll have to stop a little bit. I'm trying to rush on. Acts chapter 2, verse 13. It says, Other market said, These men are full of new wine. In other words, they are some type of drink that we ain't never heard of before. These men are full of new wine. But Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, or Judah, and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words, 
For these men are not drunk as you suppose. They're drunk, but they're not drunk like you think they're drunk. <laughs> these men are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. See, when they begin to imbibe on the Holy Ghost, get full of the Holy Ghost, they begin to get drunk. See, see we're going to talk about it a little bit. Y'all know how it is. They begin to get drunk. See, when you begin to fellowship with the Holy Ghost, I'm talking about when you begin to pray in your prayer language, when you get that prayer language. See, sometimes folk get filled with the Holy Ghost and they speak in tongues one time but watch this, it's a language that God gives us to pray, a prayer that we don't know how to pray ourselves in our natural tongue. Yes, sir. And we don't even understand what we're saying, but it's doing something that we can't explain. Yes. I want to dwell on that too, dog. I'll talk about that next week in part two. I gotta hurry on, y'all. Jesus can't finish all this today. But it's, they, they got drunk on the Holy Ghost. And then that's the first brand of wine. It's the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is that first brand you ought to be drinking. Okay. But the second brand of wine you ought to be drinking is the Word of God. The Word of God. Turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 55. Isaiah 55. I'm trying to learn how to be timely. And if it don't work, that means it ain't for me. Got to say it. Isaiah 55, look at verse 1. Watch this. Watch this, watch this. Check, 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 check it out. Check it out. He says, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsted, come ye to the waters. And he that had no money, come ye, buy and eat. And come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. He said, Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and labor for that which satisfied not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. It says, Come and buy bread, buy milk, buy wine. By bread, by milk, by wine. In other words, you got meat, milk, and wine. See, see, notice the progression. It says you, 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 you have you have meat, milk, and wine. So you have these three aspects of the word. The milk is for the ones who are unskillful. The bread are for those who have grown a little and, and don't get offended as much. But the wine is for those who want something impossible. He said, he said, watch this. Look, go down to verse 10. And watch, watch how he described the word. He said, as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and turn it not thither, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing wherefore I sin. See, when we begin to get drunk on the word and get drunk on the Holy Ghost, it brings us to a place to where we become unstoppable because he said, when my word goes forth, it's not going to come back without doing what I set it out to do. Yes, sir. Watch this. We got to learn how to get drunk on the Holy Ghost <laughs> and get drunk on the word. See, see what we do, what we do is is we come to church and that's happy hour. <laughs> and we get drunk, but when we get home, we lose our buzz. Yeah. Yeah. And we wake up the next morning with a hangover. See, an alcoholic who see I, I wrestle with alcoholism from the age of eleven to twenty-two. Watch this. Watch this. If I was going to continue to function without the pain of my alcoholism, I had to stay drunk. Yes, sir. Here the dog. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't act like you don't know. So I had, I had to stay drunk. 
Okay? I'm, I'm just doing it. Using the allegory. I'm not saying you go get drunk. Literally. I'm saying, I'm saying, but you got to get drunk and stay drunk. You got to get drunk out of the Holy Ghost and drunk out of the Word and stay drunk. In other words, you, 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 can't, you can't come here and get you a shot. <laughs> Throw it back. And then you leave here and don't get another drink until next week. Because you're going to have a hard week. Yes, sir. Because <laughs> your Monday morning going to start out and you're going to be miserable. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't know what you're doing. I used to tell folks, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to drink. <laughs> well, I, okay, anyway. <laughs> okay, okay, I said, I'm, I'm using the illustration. I said, and if I was going to stay drunk and stay functioning without the pain of my alcoholism, I had to stay drunk. Yes, sir. When, when I left the club, Jesus. <laughs> I had a little stash put back somewhere else. Yes, sir. So I can give you a little meal <laughs> throughout the day in order to keep functioning. Yes, sir. I'm trying to make this legal, right? I said, I said, and so, and so when I, when I, when I, when I stay drunk, I learn how to mix my own drinks. Ooh. See, that's how we have to be in the spirit. We have to learn how to mix our own drinks. In other words, we gotta go out and spend time with the Holy Ghost while we're by ourselves. Right. Learn how to go and get in the Word and start taking this Word and putting it with this Word and putting it with this Word and putting it with this and mix our own drink and get drunk on the Word and the Holy Ghost. Yes, watch this, watch this. If, if you learn how to mix the own drink, see, when I, when, when I mix my own drink, Mark, when I went to the club, I could tell if somebody tried to water my stuff down.
Jesus used parables? That was just a parable. So you can understand it, make it live for you. Get out the milk, get out the milk. Look at somebody and say, shake it up. Shake it up. Shake it up. See, watch this. See, it's, it's not just enough for you to come in here on Sundays and hear me preach and you come in here. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Okay. Some of y'all be able to relate. You know, back in the day when, when you were unsaved, <laughs> some, some of us still struggling. I say you like before Before we went to the club, we had our own glass. Watch this. We were so uncool, we didn't even have glasses. We had a big cup. Uh -huh. and, and, and before we, we, we get to the club, watch this. We drank enough to where we was already tipsy when we got there. Yes, sir. We were already tipsy when we got there, and when we got there, our, our tipsiness was intensified because we went to the bar. Yes, See, all I'm trying to say is when you come to church, you ought to already be tipsy off the word of the Holy Ghost. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and then when you come in here, you ought to have an expectation from God to where you make it an order, and God begins to give you what you want, and you get high. <laughs> and when you get drunk, for real, you need a designated driver. And guess who the designated driver? The designated driver is the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost, he begins to take you to where you couldn't get to by yourself. Yes, sir. I'm done. Let's stand to our feet.